So thanks everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how to make sure that when you're building a website or a native app that, and you have video in it, that you don't kill my data plan or, or anyone else's data plan and make sure that video shows up quickly, beautifully and without stalls. I'm Doug. Um, oh, off a of quick time, back to PowerPoint. All right. Um, so what do I do? I'm originally from Seattle, but I've been traveling uh, around Europe with my family for the last two years. Um, we were in Edinburgh for another month or so. I do freelance developer relations. I help people, help companies reach out to developer communities. I write blogs, I do videos, I talk at conferences. I do a lot of performance stuff. So I'm gonna to talk today about video performance, but I do web audits, I do native apps to make, native, make apps run faster because when things are slow, that stinks. So I talk about images, I'm talking about images tomorrow night. Um, I wrote a book called High Performance Android Apps. If any of you want to read about Android, that's the PDF. And if you ever want to just talk about performance or whatever, I'm the only Doug Sillers on the internet, so I'm really easy to reach. There's a chef in Glasgow named Doug Sillers, but that's, that's the internet. No, that's Doug Sillers in the world. Um, but let's talk a little bit about video. Um, as you all know, video is appearing everywhere now. You can get it, you know, it, you know, a few years ago there wasn't as much video online, but now, you know, there's all these things like Netflix is half of the internet at 9 o'clock at night, right? Because everyone's streaming video at home. There's a lot of video out there. And, you know, video can really hurt your data plan. Uh, last month I had the opportunity to go speak at a conference in Russia. And my SIM is an Irish SIM because I've been traveling around with my family. And I was like, I wonder how much it'll cost if I go to, if I go to Russia. And it's 10 euros, 24 cents a megabyte. So we're going to talk in euros for the rest of this talk as to how many meals my family will have to skip if these web pages open. <laughs> or like, can you imagine calling your bank, well, my mortgage is late because. Um, so what I did is I've gone through the web and looked at different, lots of different pages and ways to optimize video. And I found a lot of ways not to deliver video on the web. And so I'm going to use some of those examples of uh, ways to not deliver on the web. Has any of you used web page tests before? I see a few nods, but basically it's an open source tool that lets you test how fast a web page loads. Webpagetest.org, it's a really cool tool. Web page test powers the HTTP archive, and every two weeks they query 1.2 million websites. So you can look at all the websites out there and see what they're doing, and are there better ways to deliver content? Are people doing things the right way or the wrong way? And I went and looked at video. And so the way web page test works, this is, uh, there are locations all around the world, but here I'm testing meetup.com in Virginia with a Motorola G4, a real, mo a real mobile device. You can throttle the network connection, and then you just test the web page and see what happens. And so, anyone in here use Webpack? Yeah, all right, a lot of hands there. So, last, end of last year, the webpack.js.org, every time you loaded it, it made 1,100 requests. And if you go to the bottom of the Webpack webpage, you see little images of all the sponsors. And they were using an API, and the API changed, and it was adding a redirect for every single image. So rather than just downloading the image, it was requesting the image and then going another place. There were 600 redirects on this page. And so um, the yellow line, each one of those lines is a request, and you can see all the yellow lines. I couldn't fit it all on the screen, but there were 600 of them. But Webpage Test is a tool that helps you find issues with your web page. I found this, I submitted a pull request and it's fixed now, so it's not a problem anymore. But in the HTTP archive of these 1.2 million websites, you can see videos growing year over year, you know, by about a percent a year on these web pages, web pages that have video on them. So about 4% of mobile websites at the end of last year and 5% of desktop websites had video. Um, when you look at a web page, this is a mobile website Speed index is a way of describing how fast the page loads, and it's given in milliseconds. So the median website loads in 7.7 .7 seconds, but when it has video, the median site is 11 seconds. So we're already talking the web page takes four seconds longer to load if you have video on it in general. But it's not because of video, but the pages, as you might expect, if it has video, the pages are a lot bigger, right? The median website's 1.2 megabytes, uh, the median website with video is seven megabytes. But you can see there's only two and a half megabytes of video. The problem is as soon as you put video on your website, 
you probably have a lot of images, you have a lot of CSS, you have a lot of JavaScript, you have a lot of other stuff, right? It's a very interactive website. So, you know, it probably has a megabyte more of images from half a megabyte to 1.5 megabytes, right? When you're building a web page with a lot of media, you end up having lots of different types of media. It makes these web pages really, really big. Um, when we look at where the video is coming from, I was actually, you know, you see Akamai, you see Google, you see Cloudinary, you see AWS, you see CloudFront. Facebook's number one, which kind of surprised me, Facebook CDN. So most of the video uh, that was found on this study was from Facebook, and I'll talk about why that's bad in a minute. Um, but let's talk about when video's delivered, right? We talk about video killing the data plan, but when you look at the metrics that people use for video showing up on the web or anywhere, there's three metrics that people use. Did the video start? It's kind of important. Did it stall? So did it, you know, did you get the spinny thing and it stopped playing in the middle? And then finally, did it look good? And so what we're going to try to do today is show ways to deliver video in a way that it starts quickly, that it doesn't stall, and it looks good, and it doesn't kill my, video, my data plan. So we're going to optimize the video delivery so that it starts fast, doesn't stall, and it looks good. So <clears throat> there's a company out there that's come up with this idea called Buffer Rage. And it's when the video stops playing, people get really, really mad. And there are actually studies out there that when people get really mad, they throw their phones. 4% of mobile users admit to throwing their phone when there's a slow mobile website. So um, we don't want buffer rage and we don't want broken phones. So this is data from Q1 of last year. Conviva is one of those, you know, all of the analytics that happen on different web pages. Conviva watches video. And they, in Q1, saw 17 billion plays. And what they found is only 86% of them worked. Now, can you imagine as a developer if your tool only, or your app only worked 86% of the time and failed 14% of the time? What they found, the red line, 400 million videos, somebody pressed play and it didn't start. Just never started. And then 11.5%, 2 billion, Somebody pressed play, it was going to work, but it took so long that they gave up, right? And so that's something else we want to avoid. Everything, it was built correctly, but it took so long that uh, people weren't able to watch the video. So 11.5% of all plays, people just gave up. Um, and they assume, they estimate that's about 800 million hours of video play lost in just Q1 of last year. And they keep updating these uh, every quarter. The numbers are about the same every single quarter, so I've been lazy and I haven't updated the slide, but it's still pretty bad. So why does video fail to start? I'm sure you guys have seen stuff like this, where you go to a web page and they're like, oh, we don't have the rights to show that in the UK. Um, <clears throat> obviously, this is an American TV, uh, TV show. Um, when I use Amazon from the States and I try to use Amazon video on my phone, it actually says, oh, it looks like you're traveling. When you get back to the States, here are the videos you can watch. But while you're traveling, here's the stuff you can watch while you're in the UK. Right? They save me from getting to this stage like, oh, that's there? Awesome, I want to watch that. And then you get, oh, sorry, it's not there. Especially when you look in the dev tools and you realize it took 230 requests and 3.1 megabytes to tell me, oops. <laughs> right? It didn't take 19 seconds, but they've got a beacon that refreshes every five seconds that's sending analytics saying it, they didn't watch this one. No, they didn't watch this one. So I was just really slow on my screenshot, which is why it looks like it took 19 seconds. Um, so like in general, there are ways around this, right? If you know the video won't be able to be watched in that geographic location, maybe say, hey, when you get to whatever country, you can watch it, but you can't watch it here. But I think the bigger chunk is this 11.5% of videos where everything was built correctly. It should have played in whatever country it was in but it didn't start. And so in Europe, the average video start time is 4.3 seconds. So if they press play, it takes four seconds before the video shows up on the screen. Now this is an average of everyone. This is people on gigabit fiber in their house, on super fast Wi-Fi. This is people you know, at work on their Wi-Fi. This is people out in the country camping on 2G trying to watch a YouTube video. Right? You're trying to take an average of this crazy, you know, different amount of devices and network speeds. But in general, 4.3 seconds for a video to start. Um, a study was done that found, like, how long will people wait before they give up when a video starts? And basically, they found that nobody drops 
watching a video for two seconds. 100% of people will hang out for two seconds, but every additional second, you lose 6% of your viewers. <coughs> so at three seconds, you've lost six, right? 12, 18. So the longer it takes, the more people disappear. It depends the type of video. So for short play videos, like a cat dressed up like a shark on a Roomba chasing a duck, after about four seconds, you're like, what? And you decide to move on to like better things. Hopefully, you move on to do better things with your life. Um, so people abandon those videos a lot faster. But if you're going to sit down and watch a TV show or a movie, you're, gonna ha you're planning to sit down for an hour anyway. Like if it takes an extra four seconds for the video to start, most people still hang out and they'll watch. They'll wait longer for a long play video. So I went and looked at all of these websites, 36,000 mobile websites, 55,000 desktop websites. As you might imagine, they mostly overlap, like 30,000 are on both. But what was interesting is 19% um, of the videos are identical on desktop and on mobile. Right? So they're serving the exact same content that for fast internet connections, desktop computers, that they're sending to mobile devices and God knows what kind of connection. Right. Um, so if the videos are identical, either it's going to start really fast on, it's going to be very low quality and it's going to start fast on the desktop, or it's going to look really, really good and take forever to start up on a slow mobile connection, right? If you're serving the same content to this, to you're serving to your people on 3G, right? You just can't do the same thing. It's not going to work the same way. When I talk about image optimization, so if you're interested in that, come back here tomorrow night. I'm going to give a talk on image optimization. This is uh, Josephine the goat back in Seattle. Um, but when I optimize this image of Josephine, there are a bunch of things I can do to make it this image smaller. So it started off at two and a half megabytes. I can lower the quality of the image, so I'm removing pixels, right? But if I remove the pixels, 85% um, is what Google recommends for images on the web. Structural similarity is a cool algorithm that you can't tell the difference. You're removing pixels until the human eye can't tell the difference. You know, I make it half the size. Uh, I can change the format to WebP. I can make it responsive, so I can just make it the right pixel dimensions for a mobile device. At 1,400 pixels wide, it's 204 kilobytes. And here I did this all with a uh, web-based tool called Cloudinary. I uploaded the full-size image. I just set auto quality, format auto, and width to 1,400, and it generates that image for me on the fly. It went from 2.5 megabytes to 200K, so like, you know, 10% the size. And if we look online, in general, mobile images are smaller than desktop images, as you would expect, right? Big screen, little screen, right? You should serve smaller images to, to uh, mobile devices. But when you look at video, the first thing to look at is see the y-axis, 0 to 7? Look at the axis now. It's 0 to 70 for video. Percentiles of video. And if you look out here, mobile videos, we're sending larger videos to mobile than we're actually sending to the desktop. So that seems a little backwards too, right? We should probably not be sending larger videos to mobile devices in terms of tonnage than we are sending to the desktop. So when you have video, this is, this is Nora the goat. You get a bunch of different videos, right? You've got pictures over time and you've got an audio track. So there are all these different things that we can modify to make these things smaller. Um, when you have a video, it's broken into a group of pictures. And so this is, this, this is the image from Wikipedia. Um, but basically, the, the green images are full images. And then all the images in between use vectors to predict where everything's going to show up. So those images are a lot smaller, compressing over the time dimension. That's why videos have better compression. So the, the P frames are 50%. The B frames are 25% the size of a regular image, which gives us that compression. And so we can actually see that. You can do this in FFmpeg. You can see where all the vectors are of Nora eating some cedar leaves. And you can see the B frames. And so now you can see that's the compression, right? We're getting compression. It's, it's reusing those pixels so that we can get this image, or this video delivered in a very small size. Um, which brings us to animated GIFs. We all love animated GIFs. And people told me that shows my age when I say animated because they're all just GIFs now, right? Um, but you know, when you think about a GIF, we get excited, right? <coughs> so 
But the problem is, if you ever read the spec for GIF from 1990, it's like, we have a plot, we have animation, but we don't recommend that you even use it. <laughs> right? It's in the spec. Um, so there's Nora, right? 1.4 megabyte video. When I make it an animated GIF, it's 3.8 megabytes. We're going backwards. And the reason is, of course, it doesn't have that group of picture compression. It's literally a flip book of, of static GIF images. Um, so what a lot of companies do now is they just serve a video. They cut down the number of colors to 256 colors because in 1990 there were only 256 colors. I tell my kids that, they don't believe me. Um, you strip out the audio because it's, it's a silent video, right? You don't need an audio track. Um, and you can actually see that, like, this is Twitter, right? And you can see down in the corner it, sees, it says GIF. I enlarged it in case I didn't know if the screen would be big enough, right? But when you look at it in DevTools, it's not really a GIF. They put the Chiron on there to say it's a GIF, but it's an MP4, <laughs> right? So Twitter and Facebook and Slack and everyone where you use animated GIFs, you're sending movies that are just looping. <laughs> and the reason for that is that GIF is, as, as a GIF is 2.5 megabytes and it's like 119K when it's served as a movie. So it makes a lot of sense to deliver it as a movie. And the way you do that, of course, on the web is you say video loop autoplay and you have to put muted for it to autoplay on mobile. And that's because Chrome and Safari engineers sit in meetings too, right? And you, they don't want the video to be really loud when they're not paying attention and they're browsing the web. Um, and Firefox is going to do this too on mobile. They just announced it. Um, and if you're really into this sort of thing, in Safari, you can actually put videos in the picture tag. So you can actually load, a, so here in a picture tag, it tries to load the first source that it understands. So if you're in, um, if you're in Chrome, it'll do the animated WebP. If you're in Safari, it'll do the MP4, and then everyone else will get the animated GIF. And the reason that's really cool is that animated, or the MP4, is like 250K and the GIF is 3.8 megabytes. So it's gonna load so much faster for your Safari users. But let's look at what videos are being used out on the internet today. They're mostly MP4s. There's some WebM. I'm not gonna get to WebM. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about TS because those are streaming files. So we're gonna talk a little about video streaming as we get later in the, in the talk. But um, I mentioned that 19% of all videos are the same on mobile and desktop. This is baseball. This is the Boston Red Sox. Same video on desktop and on mobile. 17.6 um, megabytes. Um, you know, the size isn't bad. It's 960 by 540. It's 83 seconds long. So it's a replay of an entire baseball game. So it's going to be pretty long. It's 1.78 uh, megabits per second. That's a pretty decent stream. But what if you lowered the quality a little bit um, and just downscaled the, 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 the bit rate? lowered the quality a little bit. I, again, I used a, a cloud-based tool to do this. Um, it lowered the, the quality of the audio, it lowered the quality of the video, um, but now the file's 22% smaller, and it still looks great on desktop. And then, of course, you can re-encode it to a smaller size for mobile. Um, and if you add those up, you're still about the same size. It's about 20 megabytes instead of 17, but you're delivering a lot less content to your customers. It's gonna appear a lot faster. These videos take a long time to show up, even on a fast desktop connection, just because they're so big. I mean, if, to wait for 17 megabytes to download, that can take some time. If you get it 13, I mean, it'll still take a long time to download, but it'll be faster. On mobile 6.4, if you're on Wi-Fi, that might be pretty quick. Um, other things that I've seen, this is a breakdown of a web page. The web page on desktop downloaded 260 uh, kilobytes of video. And on mobile, it downloaded twice as much, right? Why are we downloading twice as much video on mobile? Um, well, it turns out that the, uh, the mobile device is a retina device. So they have a retina version of all of their videos. And so it downloads a retina version of the video to a mobile device. I tried to look at both of them. I couldn't tell a difference. Like, if you're going to do that, make sure you can really tell a difference because, I mean, most of the time you can't tell a difference. To make matters worse, well, now you can see here's the source, right? It serves a different data for retina versus default. 
Um, but they actually hide the video for most mobile devices in the CSS. So they download 500K of video and then they hide it. So of course, the best practice there is if you're not going to show the video on the screen, don't download it. It'll make the page load faster. It'll use less data. It won't kill my data plan. Um, preload equals auto is the same way. If you put preload equals auto in the source tag, <coughs> the browser will download that video whether or not anyone watches it. So this is somebody's home page, and every single time that page loads, it downloads 23.6 megabytes of video, whether or not it's being watched, right? So this is something that, this is great if you're Netflix and you know they're going to watch the movie. If you know someone's going to watch the movie, this is great. If the odds are they're not going to watch it, this will save your company a lot of money by not doing this. Um, metadata is much the same thing. It downloads the first 5% of the video. And so in this case, this is a, the waterfall diagram. In green, you can see the video being downloaded. It's really big. Um, I sort of call this the mobile middle finger because it, you know, when you're downloading a lot of video, you get this sort of giant horizontal line. Um, there's one request for video right here, um, but it was 2.7 megabytes. And we can try to find that on this web page. That's a YouTube video at the top. That's not it. So you scroll, scroll, scroll. Scroll, there's the video. So 3.7 megabytes, about 15 viewports down. No one's ever going to see it, right? That's just wasting data. So that one, you could probably say preload equals none. Let it, don't even look at it because it's a 150 second video. It's 1080p and it's 100 megabytes. So when you download just 3, 5%, it's going to be like four megabytes of video. Um, so mind your customer's data plans. Think about these things and audit what happens when you've got a video on your web page. Um, in general, you should avoid preload equals auto unless it's going to show up on the, unless you know they're going to play it. And then metadata, if you think they're going to watch it, you should, you should test it out, see if it's worthwhile. Um, background videos, have you guys seen background videos on web pages? This should have a video playing. I think it'll play. It's not playing automatically, we'll make it play. All right, so in the background, there's this video playing, and it, you know, now I want to take my kids to this place because that really looks like a lot of fun, right? I mean, there are they're marketing companies that say having a background video adds 80% more engagement. These are companies trying to sell background videos, right? Take that data with a grain of salt, but like, it's kind of cool. It really draws your attention. It, it, it does increase engagement, I would say. Um, that video was 5.3 megabytes. But it had an audio track that nobody hears, right? So 5% of the file could be removed and nobody would be the wiser. So it would download faster. It's just wasting data, right? Um, if you're going to have a silent video, remove the audio track, best practice. Um, and actually, if you have a silent audio track, the MP4 format still saves a huge data chunk you should just strip out that whole track completely, even if it's a silent track, because that still takes up. It's, there's still a, con a container for that track in your, in, your, in your MP4, so you should just remove it completely. Um, it still downloads the video on mobile. You can see the green lines there at the bottom of my waterfall. Um, but again, they hide it, right? Um, so you don't actually ever see the video. So again, don't download the video if you're not going to show it to your end users. Um, this web page actually has a video fallback JPEG that's supposed to show up that's a megabyte. I'm going to talk about images tomorrow, but like that's way too big. And it doesn't ever show up. It downloads the megabyte video. It downloads five megabytes of video, but none of that ever shows up on the screen because um, they block it. They don't ever actually call that CSS. All right, one more video background. This is for a website. Um, if you hang out at this part of the web page long enough, you may see the video if you're on a really fast internet connection. Um, so let's look at the video. The first thing we learn about this video is that Bob Ross was not just a painter. All right, that one worked. That flopped the last time I gave this talk. They're like, Bob, who? All right, good. Um, the video is 33 and a half megabytes. It's 27 seconds long, like a background video that's 20 se like five seconds, 10 seconds, 
30 seconds long is a little long. It's, uh, <laughs> right? It's bigger than my screen right here. Um, and it's 10 megabits per second. Like, this is just a little bit too large. So you should always resize the video to something reasonable for a desktop, maybe even have a separate one for mobile. Um, this is from DevTools. If you rename it 720p, that doesn't re-encode it to 720p. <laughs> I don't like making fun of people, but sometimes it's just too easy. Um, it's new. Um, <laughs> it, it is new. Um, but if you resize it, right, you make it 1080p, which is probably still too big, it's 8 megabytes. 720p is 4.3 megabytes. 33 megabytes, no one's going to hang out at the top of your web page long enough to see that. That's sort of like the classic, it works great on my machine. The developers are like, I see that video right away. It's there all the time. But nobody else sees it. So make it smaller so that your customers might actually see the video. Um, and then, of course, don't download it on mobile if it doesn't show up on mobile, um, because it does. Um, video isn't cheap. So Garth Brooks fans, any Garth Brooks fans here? All right. <laughs> Not really. One. One. All right. If you go to his web page, we've got this auto-playing video, which is awesome. I think that's really cool. Um, if you look really carefully around the outside, you probably can't see it, but the background is also a video playing in the background of the foreground video. Um, so the first video is 51 megabytes. Then the background video is 7.3 megabytes. And then they've got a 6.2 megabyte animated GIF all on the landing page. Um, they're all being served out of S3. And they're not using a CDN. So the thing is, when you serve out of S3, um, you're paying uh, 9 cents a gigabyte, right? And so. If you're serving up 67 megabytes on every single download, it's half a cent every single time someone comes to your website. Right? That's, if they're not using a CDN, they're spending a lot of money just to deliver this content to their end users. Um, to make things worse, Chrome has a bug that if it's a large video, it doesn't get cache and it just downloads it a second time and a third time. I filed this bug. I was really proud of finding this one. So if you go to the Garth Brooks website, you can download the video over and over and over and over. And like, that's two and a half cents right there. <laughs> Just from that one video. Um, like, this is probably not the best, you know, if you want to really troll someone, this. I mean, this isn't the way to do it, but like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a, you know, like, the, the kids are like, Dad, I can't do anything on the computer. Yeah, I know, I'm screwing over Garth Brooks. Um, <laughs> But like, you should be careful about this because it's going to end up costing you a lot of money, especially if someone just leaves that page open. Like, uh, the phone rings and they get up and the page is just downloading the video over and over and over again. So best practices so far, like if you're using retina size videos, be careful. If the video is not going to show up, don't download it. Avoid preload equals auto unless you think they're going to really watch the video. Preload equals metadata, we talked about that. For silent movies, strip out the audio track. Don't duplicate video traffic. Um, big files can cost you big money. Like if you get a lot of people visiting your web page, it could cost a lot of money. And that all comes back to respect your user's data plan. So think about that 51 megabyte Garth Brooks video. If I were in Russia, that's 500 euros, right? Because it, it's hmm? It's, it's worth it. All right. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about video streaming. Um, so the way video streaming works is you get a bunch of different bit rates and it serves the right bit rate to your device. And so this is actually really great. So you can have a video bit rate that's perfect for your phone, the right bit rate for a, you know, a laptop or for a desktop or for even bigger screens. The player can read it sort of like a menu. It can pick the right bit stream. It starts downloading those segments and then the video starts playing. And so you know the buffer is sort of that the line in front of the dot, right? That's how much has been downloaded. You know you're not going to run out of video yet. So what happens, so then the video is playing, and it can estimate the throughput, and it can get the optimal bit rate eventually. So you, sometimes you'll watch a video, and it's really grainy to start, like it looks really horrible, and then about three seconds in, it sharpens. What they're doing is they're downloading the really crappy video bit rate at the start, 
Why? Because it starts fast, right? You're downloading this really low quality video. It'll download, it'll start playing really fast, knowing that in four seconds it'll sharpen up to the right bit rate. So this is what a manifest file looks, it's from a TED talk. And you get a bunch of video tracks, and then um, because it's a TED talk, they've translated it in, with subtitles for like 15 different languages, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but let's look at the video tracks. And what you have here is for each different stream, you have two lines. You can see uh, the bandwidth for that first line is 1.4 megabits per second. You can see the codec. The resolution is 640 by 360. And then there's a link to where all the files are so it can start downloading them. And then you can see there are a bunch of different resolutions, a bunch of different bit rates. And the player can choose from this menu to decide what's playing. Um, so what I found is, uh, a lot of, so there's 15,000 streaming video files that I found on in the HTTP archive. 2,000 of them are identical. That's the first stream choice because it always picks the same stream, desktop or mobile. Um, if you pick too high a bit rate, it takes a long time for the video to start, right? You have to get this big file to download for it to play. Um, and if the buffer takes too long to fill, maybe the network isn't fast enough, um, the, the player will quickly go around and change the bit rate. But you just added more delay to that startup time. And if you have a long startup time, we all know that people give up. So we really want to, in general, most video streaming people start with very low bit rates because it's a very fast startup. The video starts quickly and then eventually it'll sharpen. Um, once the player starts with that low, chooses a low bit rate, the buffer will fill up and the video will play. <clears throat> and so that's probably why some of these videos don't start. They start with too high a bit rate. If you're starting with like five megabit per second video and I'm on a slow 3G connection, it's just never going to play. And that might be why we have 11% of people not able to watch video. So like I said, most people start with the lowest bit rate to start and then the higher bit rates come up later. So you start with that really crappy video. It starts quickly and then sharpens to a really nice looking video. The opposite is this, where you start with a really high bit rate, it doesn't play, you go to the low quality bit rate, and then you get to there, right? You just added a whole step at the very beginning, slowing down your video playback. Amazon goes with Goldilocks, and they pick that middle bit rate. And the reason is, Amazon is longer play videos, right? They're always a half hour, they're an hour, they're a movie. They know people will hang out an extra couple seconds. And if you ever watch a video on Amazon Prime, if it's, it will always start not with black, It'll start with a really sharp picture from the very beginning. From the very beginning, the video looks great because they start with a higher quality bit rate. It's sort of like their differentiator. Um, it's an approach that you might look at if you're doing a lot of streaming video. I can look at all of these. You can see the first one to show up on the screen. These are film strips loading them in a mobile browser. The first one to show up, obviously, is the lowest quality bit rate, right? That's the lowest quality video at 11 seconds at the top row. But down here, that's the same quality video six seconds later because it tried that really high quality video, it didn't work, and then it fell back to this one. And then the Amazon approach is sort of in the middle, but it's a high quality video. So you sort of get, it took a little longer, but it's a really high quality video. Right, so you get this. With the high quality, the initial quality is low for most people. With a low quality video, it starts up fast, but the quality is low. And then the Goldilocks approach is, it takes a little longer, but the quality is really good. Um, the other cool thing you can do with video streaming is you can separate out the audio tracks from the video tracks. And that way you can specify your English, your German, your Spanish, serve the same video to everybody and just slap on a different audio track and you don't have to worry, it's, there's less files for you to, to worry about on your server. <clears throat> and so you can see here with this TED Talk, the, the video is sort of that green teal and then the audio is gray. Um, so let's look at a TED Talk streaming. And what I found is it starts at this first bit rate and then it's got stuck in the lowest quality bit rate for the entire video. And it looked really grainy, like the quality wasn't very good. And I couldn't figure out why, so I started digging in. I wanted to see what was going on. And what I discovered is they're saying 1.4 megabits per second, but it's actually encoded at 600 kilobits per second. They're overstating the bitrate by 2x, so the buffer fills up twice as fast. This will never stall, but the quality can be really low. So <clears throat> I went to the other extreme. This 
is giving the exact right bit rate. So it may stall more often, but the quality is going to be as high as possible. So you might want to, you know, obviously there's uh, a, uh, a continuum here and I went to the far other side. But as soon as I started this, the first thing you'll notice is the y-axis is, uh, you know, four times smaller or three times smaller, whatever. Um, but it eventually, you know, the bit rate dropped at the very beginning to 64, but quickly recovered to the 600. Now, you see the name in that first column? You know when you watch a TED talk, there's like the, the TED logo and the sounds and the logo? That's their, the thousands, that's their intro. So they play a couple frames of the thousands and then the actual TED talk starts. But the intro was still dropping to that low bit rate and I couldn't figure out why. So I dug in a little bit deeper and when you look at this, this is the list of all the files. You see it says ext inf five seconds. <coughs> <coughs> That's telling you how long that segment is. The next one's 6.7 seconds. The next one's 0.125 seconds. But if you look at the number of bytes, like the ratios don't quite work out. Like it's one megabyte for five seconds. 6.7 seconds is 200K, right? The numbers like it just doesn't, like the ratios don't make sense there. So I started playing around with this, see if I could make those numbers match up. And I could never get it to work, so I said, screw it, we're just gonna download the entire intro in one swoop, one 12 second long swoop. And it worked perfectly. Like we got great quality from the very beginning, it didn't drop down to lower quality, and it actually went to a higher quality than I'd seen in any other of the experiments. So what you can do here is by looking at the way the streams are coming in, you can optimize it for both not stalling and also to improve the quality for your mobile, for your, for your customers. Now, video streaming is great, but what happens when you have more than one stream on one web page? And that brings me to Ghostbusters. <laughs> because do you remember what happens when you cross the streams? I, I don't know if we'll hear the audio. I need to put subtitles on here. All right, it's not that bad when you do that on a website, but people do this. So let's, all right, Ghostbusters ending. All right, we can go to the next, oh no, go to the next slide. Will you let me, there we go. So this web page put two TED Talks on the same thing and it downloaded both of the TED Talks. Now the problem is if you have this much data network, both of them are competing for it so you get half the quality, right? Because they can't use the full bandwidth, they can only use half the bandwidth. Um, don't ever cross the streams. Now, I've got an example of two here and you're like, boy, that's a really bad idea. Then I found an example with 24 simultaneous streams. <laughs> and um, I was talking to a guy over here earlier. I can only test this at one o'clock in the morning to get all of the streams to play because otherwise there are too many people in my neighborhood using the internet <laughs> that I can only get one or two of the streams to play at once. But each one of these things here is a different video stream playing in the background, like as a preview. And uh, this is one of those awesome websites that you start it up and like 15 seconds later, your fan turns on. Um, in 20 minutes over here, I think I blew through 2.4 gigabytes of data traffic because they just kept downloading these 25 streams all at once. Like, don't do that, that's just ridiculous. Um, yeah, so this, in the example I have here, 245 megabytes in four minutes. Um, so I've heard a lot of people say, to heck with it, we're just going to put it up on YouTube. And that's a great idea, um, but you can expect about 700 kilobytes of JavaScript, fonts, CSS, and other stuff to download just to get those players to work. And they use six different domains, so you end up having to, you know, actually uh, do DNS queries for six different domains. So, there's a lot of JavaScript, there's a lot of stuff you have to do when you deal with third parties, so you should make sure that's something you really wanna do. That brings me back to Facebook. So I saw that 67% of all the domains for video were Facebook, and that's because, have you ever seen like on a web page, they've got like their Facebook timeline like embedded on the page, like some small businesses do this? Well, 
the Facebook, Facebook has a bug that they download 30% of all of the video inside. If you have a video on your Facebook timeline and you embed that on your homepage, they download 70, 30% of that video no matter what. And so you end up with like, this web page has no video except for in the Facebook timeline. And so it's downloading all of this stuff. And then it being like three or four megabytes of extra data that every one of your customers ends up seeing. Obviously, you're not paying for it. Facebook's paying for it. But there's a cost in the delay for your page to load. So video files are big. And when you mess up with something that's really big, you can have a huge performance impact to what's being delivered. Um, so resize your videos for the screen, quality, bit rate, dimensions, uh, retina or not retina. If you're not going to show the video, don't download it. Preload equals auto. Strip out the audio for silent movies. Don't duplicate video traffic. Um, start at lower bit rates for faster startup. Um, or you could try the Amazon effect of the middle bit rate. Um, Use the right bit, bit rates in your manifest to optimize the delivery. I showed that ex the TED Talk example. Uh, don't cross the streams and then audit all your third party hosting for performance. So it just comes down to respect your customers' data plans. When you're serving video, you can really, really impact people's video and their data very, very quickly. So with that, thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. And if there are no questions, I'll hang out later too. So. Anybody has any questions? Yeah. How do you figure out if audio and then video doesn't link up physically sometimes? If they don't link up, so you sometimes you see the video. Yes. The audio plays or first or. So most of the players that are out there will link that up for you. I have seen. And I don't know if this is a problem here in the UK, but in the United States, we always joke that you buy when you buy hot dogs, they come in packs of ten but the buns come in packs of 12. And so what you'll often see is sometimes it'll, the, the audio track will be seven, seven, seven second segments, but the video tracks will be two, two second segments. And so it might be that there's plenty of video, but not enough audio. And so the whole video stalls. Um, but the, the job of the player is to make sure that those are all synchronized. Um, so if you're having that sort of problem, you should look at the different, there are a lot of different players out there for video to make sure that they do get, come in synchronized. And you had a question? Yeah. What, why do you think the reason behind the uh, video, video rate on Asia compared to uh, North America, 3 to 4.9? I don't know. Is it faster networks? I don't, I don't know what, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, that was just the data in there in the sheet that they gave out. So um, I can only imagine maybe it's, you can imagine, you know, I know that in places like Korea, they, they know they have much faster uh, cellular connections than they do in like the United States where like, you know, if you're in the middle of nowhere, um, you can have very poor, I mean, just anywhere you can have very poor coverage. Yeah, something that I may have on that. Um, <clears throat> I lived in a tropical island for one and a half years. Mm -hmm on a mountainous region. We didn't have electricity or water. Right. But we had really good cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I could, uh, you know, uh, fill up my uh, little um, mobile uh -huh. uh, with solar power, and I could, you know, watch <laughs> Game of Thrones included. Right. And uh, when I visited the town on the island, right. it was way slower. Because there's more people there using yeah. that same tower, yeah. yeah. I was just, I was in Cologne this past summer and the company I was speaking at, their office was right by the Turing station and they can't use their cellular before 10 in the morning or between th after three o'clock because everybody's going to the train station and the towers are just jammed. So they have to use their Wi-Fi for those times. So it's sort of like, it used to be when you went to the sporting events, you just couldn't use, I don't know, is that still a problem here? I know in America they've, they've fixed that a lot where you can go to a stadium with 70,000 people and still have fast internet. It's still slow. It's still slow? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard physics problem, right? Once you get that many people trying to get on so much bandwidth. Just a quick question. Yeah. Sorry. Would it be any quicker to 
Mm -hmm. video. Yeah. The second question is, would you compare the gift to MP4 or MP4 to MP4? No, I'm sorry, gift down to MP4 to in music while down to MP3? The clicking of the ears to the clicking of the oils. So I think the quality, you wouldn't even notice the difference in the quality in the video because if you're trying to serve it as a gift, you're probably cutting down the colors anyway. Um, and so it's probably something similar to that. I don't remember exactly the audio cut down. People say they can tell the difference. I think in general, I mean, the, an animated GIF is usually two seconds long and it's usually Shaq going like this, right? Like nobody's really caring the, the fidelity of it, right? It's not really, it's, you're not going to put it up on your 4K screen and hope, for, hope it looks good. So I think you can get away with it. Um, and then your other question was... Uh, So some, I know people have looked at that, and I know Apple required there to be an audio-only track if you had video on demand, mm -hmm. um, so that you would at least get audio. But imagine if you're watching Game of Thrones and you only got the audio. Yeah. You'd well, be pretty disappointed. Like the talk, you know, right. The audio. And so I think that's why they did it that way. It prevents buffering, yeah. but the quality was so bad. I mean, I mean, generally, you're not watching a TED Talk for the video quality. I mean, I understand. It's, it's an example, right? But um, yeah, for the TED Talk, probably just getting the audio would be good enough. And it's nice to have a sort of a ghosty shape of somebody walking around on the screen. Yeah. With the, the picture tag, yeah, of course. Yeah, you bet. Oh, no worries. I'll post the slides, too. And there's a recording, so we're all good. <laughs> and there's a blog post, too, so if you're interested, you can get the, the URL for the blog post. Oh, there it is. Is that what you're thinking about? Oh, oh, I'm looking at the preview and not the, yeah, presenter failure. Yeah, you bet. So when you're trying to decide between the different um, callbacks or um, you know, like optimal signal correction stuff for what you're serving, right? Besides screen size, um, the trade, I suppose, when it comes to some video players that support it uh, or the streaming, what else could you look at? You can lower the quality of the video. So like, you know, that video from the, where it was like a 33 megabyte video, they just didn't lower the quality. It was whatever came off of the digital camera that they recorded it on, right? Like, so if you lower the quality, you lower the size of the, I mean, by just lowering the number of pixels, you know, making it 1080p video, they made it a lot smaller. Lowering the quality, you can generally go, in FFmpeg, there's a CRF, and you can usually go to like 28, and that, it cuts out so much, and nobody can tell it. Like, it's web quality video, and nobody can tell the difference, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that would do desktop and the other two for mobile. I would say you should have a couple. The trick is, you know, like with images, you can have different images and you can use media queries to decide which one shows up. You can't do that with video. Yeah. So that's where streaming comes into play, where there's an, that's, that's an advantage. Um, or you could just write some JavaScript to take care of that, right? Or you could, you know, it's a, we're a node meetup, right? So you could just serve, you can know what screen is coming, so serve the video from the, from the server. One more. Awesome. Right. Right. You know, people have always bring that up, and that's really awesome, but what about the people who aren't on 5G yet, right? So it's sort of like, the way I look at it is, you know, when they widen a road from two lanes to three lanes, it just means that you can get 33% more cars on the road than you did before. It doesn't ever actually reduce congestion on the roads, right? So people are gonna start serving crazy huge videos over 5G, but then you have to remember that there's still gonna be a lot of people out there on 4G, 3G, and even on 2G. Um, and you can't, 
you know, if you decide to kick off 40% of your user base because you want to serve 5G video, I mean, that's an option, but you're going to lose a lot of your customer base who just won't ever be able to watch it. That's always been one of those questions. It's a, it's a great question, but it's sort of like, you know, when you think about most of, you know, a, lots of Africa and a lot of, you know, Southeast Asia are on like 3G networks or 2G networks. You just got to make sure that. Right, exactly. Like everyone's getting, you, everybody threw up a huge cheer when they had to not support IE6 anymore, right? Um, <laughs> But, you know, there's still a huge number of people that are on. Um, so I spent a month in Cork, Ireland, and my Airbnb said that it had high-speed Wi-Fi. <laughs> it was connected to a 3G router on edge, right? There are a lot of areas in the, in, you know, the first world where there's still very slow network connections. So if you just go like, well, I've got 5G. It's going to work great for me, right? It's not going to work for everybody. Maybe on your island it would work, but as soon as, you know, on other islands it may not work so well. Yeah. Uh, quick. When it comes to like starting with low quality and then growing high, mm -hmm. would you say the same principles apply to just audio as well? I think so. I think most people don't. I, I would start with a lower quality. I mean, I think that's probably a good way to do it because. Um, most times, most videos, the first, most audio tracks, the first four or five seconds, you can probably get away with a lower quality. I mean, if you think about most videos that you watch, the first five seconds are intro anyway. So if it's a little pixelated, it's all right. It sharpens up by the time you get to the right. Um, so if you wanted to do with a lower quality audio and then go higher, that would be a good option, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you. Fantastic.